A while ago, I created a couple of videos about what it'd be like to implement traditional Final Fantasy job classes into Final Fantasy 7 and 8. A little after that, I uploaded a run of Final Fantasy 7, showcasing what a playthrough of the game might look like utilizing those job classes. Now, through the wonders of time compression and me recording a run, we're ready to do the same thing for Final Fantasy VIII. Before jumping into the run itself, it's worth going over what the whole job system in Final Fantasy VIII actually means for the uninitiated or those who may have forgotten. Essentially, through the use of the game's GFs, Guardian Forces, and the various stats that they allow a player to assign magic to through the junctioning system, we can create semi-traditional jobs. Jobs like the Blood Knight, Paladin, Mage, Mime, stuff like that. As we go through the run, I'll explain all the rules and caveats that I've implemented, which you can view yourself via the link below. So let's get into it. After the opening cutscene, we are introduced to Mr. Whatever, our main character, who I'll simply be referring to as Squall throughout the run. He's our Revenant Blade. Yes, it is an awesome name, thank you. Squall's currently convalescing after getting ganked by Sifa in that cutscene. As he goes about guarding, it's a good opportunity to explain the rules, what a Revenant Knight does, and how the job system I've implemented actually functions in practice. The way all this has been built makes it so that if you are playing the OG version on your PSX plugged into a CRT or some monstrously modded version of FF8 hooked up to the latest graphics card, it shouldn't matter. This system is intended to be layered on top of the vanilla release of the game like delicious overly engineered custard. The governing rule that ties all this together is the magic tier system. There are three in total. Originally, I had tiers divided by character level. Why by character level you ask? Well, if you've played FF8, you may have noticed as you've been leveling up your party, the stats of enemies and the magic that you can draw, absorb, from them increases. Monsters become stronger as you become stronger. A lot of people frame leveling up as making the game intentionally more difficult. Could not disagree more. If you're junctioning well and know your magic, you can break the game in under half an hour. How exactly you do that was mentioned in my previous video, but I'll provide a quick recap when we get there shortly. So if tiers aren't divided by character level, what are they divided by? Story progression. Tier 1 and its available magics take you through to the beginning of disc 2. Tier 2 commences at the start of disc 2 and ends when you finally obtain the Ragnarok airship. Thus begins tier 3. But mate, that's a massive gulf in time between those tiers, you may say. Honestly, it's not. Don't worry, I'll contextualize why. Say it with me when we get there. A magic tier is basically a list of spells that you can and can't use slash junction. If we take a look at our first character, Squall, we can see that this tier system is used to define which stats are allowed to junction which tier of magic. This forms the core of the job system. Every character bar Squall and Keystis have a total of 16 points that can be allocated. This is used to partly shape their jobs. As a Revenant Knight, Squall's here to hit stuff extremely hard. As such, he's got excellent strength and HP potential. His other stats, bar evasion, are all tier 2 because it wouldn't be a JRPG without the protagonist having slightly beefier stats than everyone else. You'll also notice that tiers define not only what magic can be wielded or junctioned, but also which character abilities can be equipped. This is in an effort to keep that difficulty curve somewhat intact. Lastly, we have the GFs and commands available to Squall. He gets Ifrit, Diablos, and Bahamut along with their associated commands. But that's hardly anything, you cry, as a person who just has him Renzokoken his way out of every battle with 100 triples junctioned. Trust me, this is all Squall needs for this build. He is a powerhouse. As we progress further in the game, we can cover more of the nuances to each build and what tools we have to play with, depending on our place in the story. But now, the next important part of the game is picking up our first two GF, Quetzalcoatl and Shiva. While these GFs are earmarked for different characters, every character can junction any GF. However, a character can only utilize their summons and associated abilities if it's marked in the sheet. This was done in an effort to accommodate the cadence at which a player naturally earns GF and to cover the junctioning abilities that are exclusive to GFs for a large portion of the game. To speak on the GFs we've just acquired, if you know the game well enough, you'll first want to focus on Quetzalcoatl's card mod ability, which allows you to refine items from cards. Then, the pattern taken with most summons is to focus on learning their refining abilities, junctionable stats, 
character abilities, GF abilities, and then whatever you fancy. The reason for this specific method of progression is so that we can be the most efficient and expeditious in the way we acquire new magics and then make use of them as easily as possible. Story-wise, after Squall's woken up, he heads off to Keystas' class before running into Selfie, who's just joined Balam Garden. More importantly, we want to speak to the guy by the second floor elevator so we can get access to Triple Triad. FF8's popular card game shouldn't need an introduction, we'll be utilizing this heavily to get some of the best cards in the game, which in turn can either be refined into awesome items or extremely useful magic. Getting good at Triple Triad often comes down to simply having more powerful cards than your opponents. Right now, we are on the bottom rung of that power ladder. When you first get your hands on a good card, it acts like a snowball, building up mass until you can plow through any obstacle. While it may technically be smarter to try and grab a few cards after we visited the fire cavern, I'm stubborn, so there's that. In Balam Garden, we want two cards, Minimog and Keystis. The former can be won from the hyperactive kid running circles around the main plaza. The latter can be won from the Trape van, the one in the back, who usually hangs out in the cafeteria. You obviously want to save before attempting to grab either of these cards. It makes more sense to start with the kid because he has less powerful cards in his arsenal. And our arsenal is hot ass. It's possible, it just takes a number of resets. If you're out to break the game in the quickest fashion possible, Kisti's card is how you do it. You win the card, learn Quetzalcoatl's ability to refine cards, refine her card into three Samantha Souls, and then refine those to get 90 triples. Junction it to strength and it's GG. We won't be doing any of that, obviously. However, we do want most high level cards as insurance in case we need to refine rarer magic. Triple in particular is one of the rarest magics in the game with very few opportunities to draw it. When we're eventually finished with card farming, Squall heads to Garden's main gate to find Keystis waiting for him. This is our second party member, and Keystis is a WILD CARD! Though she is only able to equip tier 1 magic, don't let that fool you. If you're smart with your magic allocation, this can be enough. By definition, she's similar to Gogo from FF6 and meant to be highly versatile. With the ability to use any GF and summon them in battle, equip any character command and equip up to tier 2 character abilities, Keystis can plug gaps in a party's makeup or just experiment with her. For now, she shouldn't be too daunting to wrap your head around because we have very few GF and abilities available. As the game progresses, her build options constantly increase. However, you'll need a decent understanding of the game's admittedly simple systems to use it most effectively. Before Squall can take part in the special operation tomorrow, he has to complete a trial at the fire cavern to earn a GF. We deliberately shy away from random encounters during most of the game. It's extremely easy to gain levels in FF8. As mentioned, they don't really enhance your characters to a great degree, it just makes enemies more powerful. The latter part we don't care about. In this run, I'm trying to keep Squall and the gang at a level where they can battle the most difficult version of Ultimessia, which caps out at level 65. If we rock up at level 100, then it's just going to be less of a challenge. It's tricky to articulate, but my playthroughs often shake down like this. At the end of disc 1, Squall's around level 20. At the end of disc 3, he's around level 40. And going into Ultimessia's castle, the gang's around level 65. The Fire Cavern unmasks one of F8's biggest issues. It's a game that inherently doesn't trust the player to understand its systems. The scaling system tries to patch over these cracks. However, if you remember playing through the Gunas sections or places where you're using a team that isn't Squall, you'll often find enemies are much weaker. It's kind of the same here in the Fire Cavern. You don't need to level up or worry about drawing a bunch of magic from enemies, though you obviously won't cure. We'll just wail on Ifri until he's defeated. The speedrun strat is to attack yourself until Squall's crisis meter is built up and he can Renzokoken away his problems. You don't even need to go that far. Summoning Shiva and hitting attack will serve you just as well. When we've successfully passed the test, we can exit the fire cavern. However, before we head back to Balam, we play hooky and go down to the beach with all the cool kids. Again, as most people will be aware, the enemies here, faster to Kalon, give decent AP for this point in the game. Those abilities I mentioned before are what we want. We're grinding here for card mod and elemental refine abilities. These grind sessions are where we often gain the most levels. During normal play, I was often running from battles or using the non-encounter feature. That was my choice, however. Once that's done, Squall returns to Garden and he's ready to take on his final assessment, the Siege of Delay. Now, being the absolute man of culture that I am, I always pronounce this as 
Dole. Though I've heard people call it Dolet before. You land on Lapin Beach, which is rabbit in French, so that's the connection that I made. Years later, upon playing the Japanese version, it's Doru, like Dol or Dole, so I guess any pronunciation is fine. Way back when it was being promoted, the translation had originally been Dole, which could have been more confusing because there's that food brand, Dole. Anyway, it's here that we eat Zell. He's our next new character, and he's joined by Sifa who will be a temporary character. Temporary characters or dream sequence characters are in the game for too short a time to worry about trying to give them a job. Just stick whatever you want on them. But we do care about Zell, so let's take a look at him. The Alchemist's stats are spread dead even across everything, though he has a ton of useful character abilities, magic and commands at his disposal. In casual play, you may not really exploit the various commands GFs can learn because on the whole, it's literally easier to junction powerful magic to attack. With that said, Zell mixes things up with a number of status focused and healing spells at his disposal. Recover is honestly great and the number of character abilities to modify his stats make him more powerful than you may think. All in all, he's just a very solid character that can do a bit of everything. With everyone now ready to head to Dole, we can get one of the best tracks and cutscenes in the game as we make our landing on the beach. There are a few things that are slightly relevant not only to this mission, but for the rest of the game. The first comes down to our seed ranking and the gill that we earn from it at regular intervals. Gill doesn't factor in too much to FFA, neither do items really. However, we do need a stockpile of gill for some necessary purchases later on. With this in mind, we do not want our post-mission evaluation to suck. I'm guessing that a number of people who played this mission may have wondered what exactly you're being evaluated on. You may know the best course of action to take, but the game is never transparent on its calculation. Jegged, which is always a useful FFA resource, sheds some light on this. Conduct is how much time you had remaining when you reached the Dole Shore. Judgment is how much time you had left after you defeated the bosses, with smaller values being better, so I'm assuming that is having more time is better. Attack is the number of enemies you've killed with more being better. Spirit is how often you escape from battle with less being better. Attitude is talking to too many people, disregarding Sifa's orders, talking to Biggs, jumping off the cliff, not saving the dog from XATM092, hiding in the pub. They're all worth negative points. In our version of events, Squall and his team will be avoiding battles. You may want to fight them to pump up your final ranking evaluation though. If you played the demo version of FFA a good while ago, you may recall that that took place during the Siege of Dole. However, there were a few notable differences, mainly that Renoa was in your party. Upon reaching the communications tower, Sifa splits from the party. But we won't be a man down for too long. Just over the hill, our next party member, Selfie, comes tumbling towards us. With a moniker like Warden, you can safely imagine what a class like this would excel in, defense. I'll say that there was a tendency from players to make Selfie like Renoa the default mate. The game does little to dissuade you from this notion, what with her limit break being random magic. For our version of Selfie, you need to disconnect yourself from that line of thought. She's got high health, vitality and spirit, meaning she can tank just about anything save a light pillar or moves of that ilk. She gains access to some exceptional magic at tier 3 with the likes of Karaga, Holy, Quake and Aura. What it's worth, I only used Aura once during this run. Her commands like Treatment and especially Revive can be super useful along with her stat boosting character abilities. Now that we have a full team that we actually care about, we have our first proper boss coming up, Elveret and Biggs and Wedge to a lesser extent. Out of the GF we currently have, which is Free, Ketokotl and Shiva, only two can actively be summoned in battle. Typically, if you're going the refining route, you'd have Water Junction to school Strength stat, making this quite trivial, but we can't do that. In fact, the majority of our team, because of the GF restrictions, are rather weak. Technically, no one can use Cure, so we're relying solely on items to cure and revive party members. Another point of contention is difficulties drawing magic. The success of draw and the magic you receive is tied to your magic stat. We're often in situations where characters have a low magic stat because of their tier or they simply do not have a GF with a magic junction. Remember, it takes a while before you can buy them from the Timber Pet Shop. This is why gaining magic through refining is so vital. Ideally, against Elveret, our best weapon is to blind it one of the few status ailments it's susceptible to. Along with that, 
you need to look out for its Storm Breath attack and more importantly, draw Siren. Our newest summon is for Selfie and will come in pretty handy. Siren has useful abilities such as status attack and defense, life and status refining and magic boost. Pairing status attack with magic like pain, drain, blind and death is often extremely useful. I screwed up the first time by forgetting to outfit Squall with an item so I literally had no way to heal anybody. Luckily you've also got help in the form of Selfie's Limit Break. Full Cure often pops up which acts as a full party heal. After defeating Elvaret, we see a cool cutscene with the satellite dish opening up. Final Fantasy loves having seemingly overly complicated mechanical components to their technology. We now must escape Dolly, but there's a metal arachnid standing in our way, X ATM 092. While this can be defeated and earn you 50 AP, it is so not worth doing it, especially in our state. We just want to neutralize it quickly when we're forced into a battle and avoid it at every other opportunity. As you bolt down the cliffside and back into town, you're presented with an opportunity to dip into the pub to avoid the boss. Doing this not only lowers your evaluation, but you miss out on the cutscene of Keistis gunning the boss down. Arriving back in Balam, there are a few points of interest. Now is as good a time as any to attempt to win the Zell card from Zell's mother. With our current collection, it's not too difficult. Refining Zell's card gives you three hyperists, which increases your strength by 60%. If you want, you can also participate in the Queen of Cards side quest. I had never bothered with this as the rewards won't be too useful for us. When we finished in Balam, there are a number of story events to progress through. Firstly, it's time for the results of the exam and the announcement of who will be gone seeds. Post finger snapping, we're left with Squall, Zell, Selfie and an unnamed dude who is actually Nida who we'll become more familiar with later. Next, Squall puts on his best digs, engages in some memory upon first meeting with Noah, and then busts some moves. Kistis calls us up to head on over to the training center because there's something she wants to tell us. The training center itself has been accessible for a while, though there's never been a need to go there. The T-Rex is the most well-known, if rarest, encounter. It's susceptible to sleep and blind and weak to ice. Casually, it's a decent place to level and farm some dino bones, Quake. But not too relevant for us. Reaching the lover's lookout or wherever it is, Kistis confesses she's no longer an instructor and instead one of us. Squall attempts to emote but has the emotional sensitivity of a wooden plank right now. He comes off worse in the English because he rarely gets to respond more than whatever on a number of occasions, though it is more varied in the Japanese version. Their heart-to-heart -heart is interrupted by a scream and they investigate, only to find alone, who they don't know is alone yet, being attacked by Grinaldo and its minions. I'll skip over a number of ridiculously trivial battles because they rarely need more of an in-depth explanation beyond I started blasting. Alone's escorted away by White Seeds, Squall gets a room upgrade, and we wake up the next morning to begin our first official mission as a seed, the liberation of Timber. Headmaster Sid gives us a brief overview of the mission. We are to assist a resistance faction called the Forest Owls to reclaim Timber that has been under Galbadian occupation for over a decade. But freeing a people from the impressive boot of Galbadia can take a backseat to Triple Triad. We also want to speak to Sid again outside of Garden's main entrance to receive the magical lamp. From Sid, we can win the Sifa card, which can be refined into three diamond armor. Then, when we're ready, we can move to the overworld, save, and rub that lamp. Instead of a genie, out pops our next GF, Diablo. There is a gimmick to this battle which makes it difficult to exploit under our jobs. You're supposed to draw cast Demi on Diablos to massively reduce its HP. While Squall is able to cast Demi, he must first draw it. However, because there is no magic junction available to him yet, though you could swap junctions around, he often fails to draw. Another solution is to use Diablos' main attack, Ravager, against it. Gravager will reduce your entire party's HP by 75%. This often bumps their crisis level up to where they can use a limit break. That's good. But Diablos often likes to physically attack characters in this state. That's bad. Diablos, like Elvaret, is susceptible to blind. That's good. So you can spam Squall's limit break if you like, or you can utilize Zell's limit. Why would Zell's limit break be useful, you might ask? Two things. You may think the only way to unlock more moves for Zell's duel is through finding magazines. Technically, it's not true. Zell, like Sabin from FF6, always has these moves. They just don't show up. Out of all of Zell's duel moves, the most useful for this fight is Meteor Strike. Meteor Strike inflicts damage equal to 25% of a target's HP, basically Demi. Combine that with a few items and Selfie's Limit Break, 
it's not too difficult a gimmick to circumvent. Obtaining Diablos marks Squall's second GF. One of the reasons Squall has so few GF is that because he is such a raw damage powerhouse, he rarely needs to summon or requires their abilities. With this in mind, they're best allocated to another party member. Diablos' summon ability, aside from looking badass, functions in a similar vein to Demi. However, the percentage of HP it deducts from an enemy is equivalent to its level. If Diablos is level 10, it will shave off 10%, 30 30%, and so on. Most effective in the early game, Diablos drops off rather quickly when enemy HP exceeds that 9999 damage cap. Skill wise though, re and good. With abilities available that increase Squall's HP and magic along with Mug and Magic Refinement, it's a great addition to the party. Not to mention its dark side ability which will expend HP for an increase in attack power. This ability becomes a staple of the Revenant Knight's moveset. After that's done, we can head to Balam and then hop on the train to Timber. On board, we are treated to the first of several dream sequences with Laguna and Co. I don't bother with any particular build for these characters. The most annoying part of this is the fact that for some reason, it has fixed character transfers for some flashbacks, but not for others. However, these sections are relatively short and the enemy's pretty weak, so it's not a roadblock. Laguna heads to Dealing City, ogles Julia for a minute before they reconvene in her room. Then we are back with Squall and the others in Timber. What's funny about this section is that Julia's performance is on a timer, so if you're on three times speed rushing through the dialogue, you're forced to just sit and wait until the performance is finished before the game allows you to continue. In Timber, we meet Watts, who guides us to the train that the forest owls use as their mobile base. Zell gets absolutely ghosted in the handshake attempts with Zone before the resistance member bites his stomach cramps. Before we go and wake up the princess, we can pick up a card from Watts, Angelo. The Angelo card can be refined into 100 elixirs. It's not as useful as refining Bahamut's card later on for 100 mega elixirs though. Once the card's in our hands, we can reintroduce ourselves to Renoa, our newest party member. The Enchantress functions as the glass cannon sorcerer. It's got all the trappings of this kind of glass, excellent magic and spirit, even speed and evasion, but lacking in HP, strength and vitality. She can equip a large number of GF, so it's up to you which ones you want to give her. Obviously, there's a chance certain characters in your current party will have them equipped. Renoa has one of the largest accessible magic pools with this system and a ton of character abilities. Her tier 2 pool is the lowest for gameplay concessions and because it thematically fits with the narrative. While she's possessed by the end of disc 2, that doesn't really pay off until you get Ragnarok and return to the planet from the lunar base. This seemed like a fitting occasion for her to be awakened and get access to her most powerful spells. Her wealth of character abilities allow her to crank up her magic and spirit to the highest out of all the party members. Renault is extremely powerful when combined with characters like Irvine too. With the Enchantress on board, we're then forced to suffer through a pointlessly long explanation of the Forest Owl's plan to abduct President Dealing as leverage to remove Galbadia's troops from Timber. We go through the rigmarole of running across train cars, inputting codes and avoiding guards in order to confront the President, but it's an imposter, Jero Jero. I always found this strange. In FF8, as far as I recall, there's no other instance of a person transforming into a monster or a monster masquerading as a human. I can only assume this is because of a day's magic. Either way, it wouldn't be an FF game without a boss that's vulnerable to life magic. This is the first of two. Rather than waste our time in a pointless battle, you can just toss an X potion or an elixir at him, which is more reliable than life or a phoenix down for a one shot. The Forest Owl's plan has failed. Time to squat and think of a new one. Points of interest in Timber are the Pet Pals magazines from the now open pet shop and swiping girl next door from the Timber Maniacs building. I didn't choose to rob that old guy's 500 gil because we need to stay hydrated. Then we proceed to the pub, fight some guards, look at that psychedelic animorph screen before handing the traveler back his precious and trash Buell card. Once you've proceeded through the rear of the pub, it becomes clear that President Dealing is intending to make a broadcast to the world, the reason why Galbadia wanted to activate the communications tower in Dole. I suppose they just couldn't have asked them. Anyway, Kistis asks us to come and help, so we split from Renoa and rush to the TV station. Zell's big mouth reveals that our student insurrectionists are from Garden. Not a good move. Idea appears and whisks Sifa away while paralyzing the rest of the team, or casts stop on them or something. Later, the team regroup in a house next to the Timber Maniacs building. 
in the event of being able to return to one's own garden, garden code dictates that they find the nearest available garden, Galbadia. But before that, there's a new card to be acquired. For the longest time after visiting Dole during its siege, I never bothered to actually return there. There's nothing really compelling you to either, aside from grabbing the Siren card, however. While you duel the pub owner as part of the Queen of Cards side quest, you can talk to him outside of that for the card. You have to beat him first, and then he'll invite you into his secret card playing dungeon. Siren is a useful card because it can be refined into status attack, which allows you to junction magic to your status for attack. Back on track with the plot, you're forced to head through a canyon to reach Galbadia Garden. Once again, several members of the party take a snooze for another dream sequence. While not particularly difficult, this dream sequence is important because it acts as the setup for acquiring some items later. You do this by tampering with several hatches, pushing boulders and exploding others. Upon returning to Lunatic Pandora, which this is, you'll then have access to Love Love G, an ultimate draw point, a phoenix pinion and a power generator. At the end of this section, Laguna and party find their backs to a cliff. Enemy Esthar soldiers soul crush Kiros and Ward, Laguna yeets them off the cliff and stumbles down after them. Back in the present, the team proceeds through the canyon and to Galbadia. We'll be back here later under some very different circumstances. For now, we've been given a new mission, assassinate the sorceress with the help of a new master sniper. Before jumping into Irvine, I always found Squall's dialogue in response to learning about Cephas' impending execution really, for a lack of a better word, weird. His exclamations of, I won't have it, and I'm not having anyone talk about me in the past tense. It's just so clunky. As a pure bit of translation work, it's technically correct. Scores like Iada, which conveys the meaning of something that is undesirable or detestable. In this case, it's how people would perceive Squall if he were to die using Kakoke, literally the grammar of the past tense about him saying what they like. But as for what a teen would say in a situation like this, it's not quite right. And I know back then for Square and a lot of translators, they were just not affording enough time or a large enough team to do the job as thoroughly as they would have wanted. And that's despite this game in particular having more robust localization help. Would I'm not going down like that man been better? No, probably not. It wouldn't have fit with Squall's character, honestly. Just have him let out some guttural yell, I think that would have done the trick. Because Squall's shtick is that he's so entrenched in his own thoughts that he can't articulate himself well to others. Maybe, like, I can't take it anymore. Before he leaves, he says, Ori wa kakoke ni sareru no wa gomen da kara na. Which is basically Squall saying, like, sorry guys, I just can't let myself become a memory. It's a pretty straight up translation, but it's a difficult sentiment to articulate in a language like English, which in these situations wouldn't lean so heavily on poeticism. I just think there's a middle ground between Squall being able to articulate himself properly, along with not using such a strange sentence. Well, we took a bit of a detour there. If you've got a more nuanced take on the translation, please let me know. Okay, so back to killing Dea. We have earned ourselves our final party member, Irvine. The trick shot is in some sense closer to a bard or support character. Their purpose is to buff the party. However, Irvine is built to go beyond that role. He's mainly focused on speed, evasion and luck. His HP and vitality are low and you may think ridiculously low, but trust me, he does just fine. Irvine ends up being so quick and able to dodge attacks that he's really solid. With access to important summons like Doom Train, which inflicts Meltdown, as well as a bunch of other status ailments and his wealth of magic, he's an absolute support powerhouse that synergizes with pretty much every character. Back on the train and we can now leave Galbadia Garden. There's a girl who plays level 6 boss cards around one of the lecture halls if you fancy stocking up to refine some cards. But our next destination is Dealing City. There's not a great deal to accomplish here other than visiting General Caraway's mansion. He's in cahoots with Galbadia Garden to assassinate the sorceress. Unfortunately, despite this being a time-critical mission, we have to pass a test first, venture into the tomb of the Unknown King and retrieve an ID. This will act as proof that we are up to the task of assassinating the sorceress. I suppose our wealth of experience slaying dozens of monsters just doesn't cut it in this job economy. We can find the tomb northeast of Dealing City, playing it casually I got lost here a bunch and found it infinitely frustrating. No matter how many times I replay this game, I always use a guide. This time, 
is no different. Retrieving the ID isn't the issue, it's on the gun blade a few screens in. It's recruiting Selfie's newest GF, Brothers, where the complexity lies. You'd best have a pen and paper or some other means of recording the student ID because it's unique to that playthrough. After it's been noted, we'll proceed through the various windy labyrinthine passages until we're ready for the showdown with Minotaur and Sacred. Our team is rather underleveled and poorly junctioned right now. That's my own fault. I decided to roll into the fight with Keystis and Selfie. Traditionally, this boss fight is rather simple. You'd cast Float on your team to avoid their Earth moves and then cast a Double on yourselves and then Float on Sacred and Minotaur in order to stop their health regening. We don't quite have that luxury with this particular build and that's on me. The battle, however, is obviously winnable. Selfie's there because she can cast Protect, which you'll need for the brother's physical attacks, especially Moa. Keystis is the only character able to draw cast which is useful for Float. She's also capable of casting Cure because we didn't include Renoa in the party. For our attacking options, you're relying on Squall, of course, who right now can only junction Aero to his attack. This is the best option for attack-focused junctions with our current tier. It's more than enough. You'll also find yourself relying much more on GFs to output higher damage. People's use of GFs in this game, in my experience, drops off pretty soon especially when you can outfit your character stats to do far more damage. I enjoy their greater utility because you are sacrificing not only more time to inflict more damage, but the health of your GF to do so, which adds more of a sense of risk versus reward. With Brothers now obtained, they can go straight on Selfie. We want to focus on unlocking its junctionable strength and spirit stats, then move on to its health boosting character abilities. As we progress further into the game and unlock the ability to purchase the main stat junctioning scrolls from the pet shop, we want to designate a main junction for a character that will not change. This makes it easier when swapping GFs between characters because there are so few gaps in their stat. Now we're headed into the final throws of Act 1 and Disc 1 of the game. There are a couple of significant battles standing in our way though. The first will be against the Igrions and then Sifa and Idea. For context, Squall may have been in the mid-20s at the end of Disc 1, but the rest of the team were below that. I would suggest getting everyone to that level 20 mark. Levels don't play a huge part as I've said, though they do offer small stat boosts nonetheless. If you're worried about falling into a level surfeit, Squall, then you can always just knock him out and grind levels with the other characters. You may also want to gain some AP down on the beach for brothers. However, the main characters doing the fighting during this portion will be Squall, obviously, Renoa, and Irvine. Upon returning to Dealing City and providing the number, who starts with the lower number first, you then meet General Caraway. He's revealed to be Renoa's father, and Julia, her mother. Caraway locks Renoa up while the adults are busy running around the city, announcing their ambush plans. When you're ready to commence, your team splits and you're now railroaded to the end of disc one. Squall and Irvine keep an eye on the Sorceress and President Dealing's imminent address, while Keystis, Zell and Selfie will occupy the gateway. They've been tasked with throwing the switch to trap Gaia at the opportune moment. While the dudes stick to their mission, Keystis feels guilty for chewing out Renoa, so decides to put the entire mission in jeopardy in order to apologize. Hijinks ensue, where Renoa ends up blocking Keystis and the crew in the room. Renoa's found an Odin bangle, which she believes can suppress Idea's powers. She rushes to confront Idea, and you can pick up a copy of Weapons Monthly by taking a detour into sewer. Weapons are, with the exception of Squall, useless. They offer minimal attack upgrades, eat up resources, but they do look cool. The limitation for the purpose of this job system, aside from Lionheart, is arbitrary at best. Renoa's smooth brain plot is no match for Sorceress, who ensorcels Renoa before parading her in front of the entire city. Meanwhile, Keystis has to complete a very Resident Evil puzzle of placing a goblet in a statue's hand in order to open a secret passageway to the sewer. From their place in the crowd, Squall and Irvine spot Renoa and, though it takes some cajoling from Irvine, Squall's convinced to rescue her. Don't worry too much about the sewer shenanigans with the other team, you should mostly be avoiding that, say for drawing a bunch of life creeps because it's an extremely powerful bit of tier 2 junctioning magic. When it's time to fight the Igrions, it may be a tougher battle than you anticipate. First things first, we needed to draw a carbuncle. Until you do, both Igrions have the auto reflect status, meaning any magical attacks will bounce off them. This GF is for Zell. Secondly, the Igrions use fire based attacks, so you ideally want fire junction to your elemental defenses. Thirdly, they have the ability to inflict slow petrification. You cure this with Suna or a soft item. Chances are you don't really have this item on you. 
nor can anyone in our current lineup use it sooner. Therefore, remedies are your best bet or just buy some soft. What makes things worse is that currently, Irvine can only attack, so we're at a bit of a disadvantage. However, he can use the item command, so is useful as a dedicated healer. With all that said, what was originally an easy battle when you had your strength decked out can require a tad more forethought this time around. Oh yeah, and don't use a free because you'll just heal him. Renoa's now been rescued, so she'll join the party. This is who we'll be rolling into the final disc one battle at our side. Kistis and the others will trundle through the sewers, which always used to confuse me, until they reach the gate tower. Despite the initial delays, they arrive just in time to bring the gate hurtling down to trap Idea's float. After some encouragement, Squall gets Irvine to pull the trigger. Idea blocks it. Two minutes later, Irvine will be pumping rounds of shotgun pellets into her face, but this bullet is ineffective somehow. Conventional wisdom says that the first thing you do in the battle against Sifa and Idea is summon Carbon Cult to throw up Reflect. We have no such recourse. Against Sifa, Squall starts off on his lonesome. His attacks aren't really powerful, they never are. Again, FF8's lack of faith in players makes a lot of bosses weaker than you think. Sure, we could have pumped up Squall's level pretty absurdly, more of a challenge, but it'd throw off the entire run. Not only that, enemy stats do have a cap, so there's a tipping point into making encounters too easy. When Sifa goes down, we'll be facing Idea, but we've got backup. Irvine's still on item duty in this battle, though his limit break can often come in handy in a pinch. Unlike later encounters, Idea can't be put to sleep in this battle, so you're relying on raw damage output. Not magical, by the way, because the spirit is so high. Squall's focused on attacking while Renoa can toss up a cure or summon one of the GF she has junction. All in all, this isn't a difficult encounter. You're not even required to win it. You just receive the AP if you're victorious. Post battle, Squall's spared with an icicle before it fades to black, bringing to a close disc one. There were a lot of Squall's dead theories that came from this, but I never really bought into them too much. I always figured magic spells had properties beyond physical damage, hence why you could tank them. Also, you know, it's a game. But before we get to checking on Squall, it's time for another flashback to open disc two. We find ourselves in Windhill as Laguna. The town's under occupation by Galvadian forces and Laguna acts as a one-man town militia of sorts. We're also introduced to Alone as the two make a mad dash to the pub where an old friend is waiting for us. You can catch up with Kiros, ask him questions, but ultimately you're dragged into patrolling the town and defeating the monsters you come across. Along with Kiros, we also meet Rain, though it's never explicitly said during this part, her and Laguna are obviously a couple. I always loved how the house has been completely annihilated with gunfire and no one's been through to patch it up. Laguna does say all the men and the boys of fighting age have been conscripted into the war effort, so it's somewhat understandable no one's been able to do a bit of plastering. If you don't have any encounters during this section and battle nothing, you still get congratulated for your hard work. Soon enough, the dream ends and we're back with some of the main cast. Those involved in the assassination attempt on Idea's life, while Renoa and Irvine have been locked up in D District prison. While we start with Zell and the gang minus Squall, we eventually pick up with the man himself who is currently being tortured. Though it seems there's no way out because Zell shared his memories with Ward, he knows the layout of the prison. After finally realising that his fists are his actual weapons, you are able to beat up some guards, claim your weapons and escape. You are thrown into a battle with Biggs and Wedge once again. Now is a good opportunity to draw some decent tier 2 magic from the dynamic duo. Haste, Regen, Reflect and Shell are all excellent. Haste will eventually be the best speed junction, regen and life are going to be the best for health and vitality. Reflect is the best for spirit along with shell. It's always important to cross reference or simply scroll through your available magics to have the best spells junctioned. Saying that, the fight with Biggs and Wedge isn't all that tough as once again, the game is unsure how well you've outfitted your characters. When they've been thoroughly trounced, you have the freedom to head up or down the stairs. Travelling right to the bottom lets you combat king number one along with some other items along the way. Going further up at floor 10 is someone who will upgrade your battle meter if you beat them a triple triad. Going through these floors can be a pain, so if you can use three times speed or encounter none, then go for it. Zell and the team eventually rescue Squall, which sends the entire prison on even higher alert. To help bust us out, Renoa press gangs Irvine into helping out, and your party divides. The most important makeup is Squall's party because they'll be facing a boss. Running in circles around the prison, you may have already encountered the GIM52A units, who face two of them and an elite soldier. Not a difficult battle. If Kistis is with you on low HP, you can just use the generator on these enemies. This blue magic ability can be learned from Black Hole, which can be card modded from a Gesper 
or you can refine 100 of them from the Diablos card. I've not spoken too much on Limit Breaks because we all know that Squall is the top G. Keystis is decent, especially for leveling, because Degenerator will OCO pretty much anything you face. She also has things like White Wind, Mighty Guard, etc. Selfie's always useful because she can slot Rapture for a one shot, Wall, Full Cure, which is handy in a pinch. Irvine can output some damage with his Limit Break, especially with AP ammo. Renoa, well, I used to think her fusion was awesome, but because it randomly selects magic, it's quite limited. And as for Zell, unless you're focused on increasing his attack, it's not too useful. In most situations where a limit opportunity appears, aside from Squall, there's usually a more effective move that you can execute. With that said, after defeating the boss, the prison begins to dig itself underground, so Squall has to shuffle along the platform until he eventually vanishes. Somehow, just fine, the crew gain access to some Galvadian vehicles in order to cross the desert. No sooner have they put the pedal to the metal and have taken a breather than they witness a missile attack on Trabia and Balam Garden. The party splits. One group headed up by Selfie will infiltrate the missile base while the other group led by Squall will rush back to Balam Garden in order to warn them of the incoming attack. I'm guessing that a few people struggled with the missile base because you would tend to dispatch your A-team with Squall to be ready for whatever awaited you at Balam. In turn, you'd have a relatively weaker level speaking team to infiltrate the base. Lucky for us, or at least for me, the leveling spread has been quite even for characters and I'd been shuffling them around enough that they were around the 20s. Another reason the missile base can be a challenge, barring the boss, is the fact that depending on how you play, there are few battles and fewer opportunities to draw useful material to junction. Good job we know what's in store. We're purposely avoiding all mandatory battles here because we don't gain much from it. That means walking past the first encounter, helping out where we need to, and ultimately increasing the error ratio of the missile console. Once all this is complete, you can finally head to the main control room where, if you've not been discovered already, you're finally unmasked. For the base, Selfie was obviously mandatory, and I chose Renoa and Keystis as the remaining party members. For the battle against BGH 251F2, we want to rely on lightning magic and summons as much as possible. I deliberately set the timer to 10 minutes because I like the challenge and you get the increase in seed rank. The boss can hit extremely hard depending on how you've set up your team and outright kill members. Blind can work against it though it has quite high resistance. Failing that, you can cast Protect with Selfie or draw Cast with Keystis. Renoa is the one summoning Quetzalcoatl while Keystis can be on healing duty. At tier 2, Selfie does get access to Aura magic in this case Thundara, though we can't quite beef up her magic stat to exploit it just yet. Back when I was a kid, I really struggled with this battle because my characters were underleveled, junction poorly, and I hadn't invested anything into my GFs. Now, if you're going the casual inform method, it's a breeze. With the job setup, it's no cakewalk by any means, but it is a decent test of your team so far. After the battle itself, I recall not knowing if I had succeeded because the team just ran around with no feedback that you've been successful. The last we see of Selfie and the gang is then being obliterated by the facility's self-destruct sequence. We then cut to our A-team at Garden, Squall, Zell and Irvine. Not only do we have a bunch of missiles heading our way, but it seems like some kind of mutiny has kicked off at the most inopportune time. As soon as you entered Garden, you're accosted by one of the faculty members interrogating your allegiances to Norg. Though we can just say yeah for now, until you've learned more, we're being OGs to the end and immediately rebuff any notion you've allied with the notorious ORG. What follows is a series of battles against relatively weak foes as you liberate each area of Garden in an attempt to find Headmaster Sid and deliver a message. Let's mosey. There's a high chance you'll run into or be forced to finally fight a T-Rex if you've not done so already. Sleep is less effective than Blind and because we've got both Diablos with Squall and Shiva with Zell, you can easily make short work of them. They are perhaps the deadliest enemy we'll be fighting during this section of the game. And this act is a taste of what I consider the intermediate portion of the game. Your team is split up quite a bit and you're not really being pushed into any significant battles until you return from space way down the line. If Zell's in your party, you can talk to the pigtail girl in the library to pick up a Mega Phoenix instead of a Remedy. 
You can even rest up in Squall's dorm if you're feeling the hurt. Eventually, after liberating the areas, you'll return to the elevator to find Shu. After catching up with her, she reveals that Headmaster Sid has been sequestered in his office all this time as it would be the last place everyone would look. Squall makes this report and is given access to the MD level of garden by Sid. There's rumoured to be a control system that may offer some help. You head into the bowels of garden or maybe the underground if we're going with the plant life metaphor. Along with regular enemies, you may encounter the triface. Not only is there a chance it will drop curse spikes, which have a number of uses, but depending on your level, you can draw powerful magic such as pain and flare. Those are tier 3, so unless you're doing your own thing, they'll be sitting in our back pocket for now. The two oil boil enemies are nothing to write home about. You can junction a version of fire to your elemental attack or bust out free you absolutely salt slugs. Once defeated, we cut to the cinematic of the Galbadian missiles making a beeline for Garden. The team rush to the control center, Squall channels selfie to mash at the controls until it activates and then shot back up to Headmaster Sid's office. Through more expert button slapping, they are somehow able to not only make Garden float, but barely avoid the incoming attack. The next day, or sometime later, Squall wakes up in his dorm. If Renoa's in your party, she'll be here. You eventually head down to the basement to see Sid speaking with someone off screen. This is the Norg we've been hearing so much about. He's part of the Shumi tribe and originally seeded Sid's plans to build Garden. While Norg enjoyed the spoils Garden and Seeds earned from their mercenary work, he obviously wasn't listening during the whole investor presentation when they explained Garden's eventual objective of defeating the sorcerers. Instead, Norg would rather sacrifice a few bad apples to save the Garden. Obviously, we don't want this and have to battle Norg. The fight has two parts. The first revolves around destroying the pod, protecting Norg. The second is then defeating the Shumi. The gimmick here is that the two spheres on either side of the pod allow Norg to conjure more powerful magic as their lights change. You can reset the change by hitting the orbs. Basically, you have one member focused on that while the rest attack Norg. It's also important that we draw Leviathan because that will be Zeld's newest summon. Sorry, Irvine. You'll just have to wait a little longer for that. You could also steal a circlet from Norg. Leviathan's useful for a number of reasons, not least of all its support magic refinability, its spirit boosts, and its elemental junctions. Along with that, it also has the recoverability, which will allow Zell to function as an X potion, recovering an entire character's HP pool. With Norg, I'm guessing dead, or at least all took it out. You can visit Sid in the infirmary who's been having a good old cry. Squall can ask him about Seed, Idea, and Norg to fill in some backstory. With that over, Shu will inform Squall that the white seed ship has appeared and they're here for a loan. Garden is no longer safe. Squall can find alone in the library but doesn't really glean much information from her before she's whisked away. Alone's not the only one on the move. It seems Garden's on a crash course to Fisherman's Horizon. Squall leads the apology tour and visits the mayor of FH. This is a pacifist settlement so they'll help fix Garden, but then out as soon as possible. Unfortunately for them, Galbadia has other plans. They've turned up in FH in order to sniff out alone. The mayor attempts to extend an olive branch, but that double piece gets gunned down pretty quick. In the end, we help them out, only to find ourselves tangling with our old, battered mechanical friend. A much weaker version than before, it doesn't take much to destroy the metal beast. Out of the scrap, crawls Selfie and whoever went to the missile base. Canonically, if there is such a thing, I think the right choice is to dispatch Renoa to help Selfie because you get a nice scene if you choose the option. To have Squall display a bit of emotion on discovering that she'd survive. In FH itself, there's not much to accomplish. You can win Quetzalcoatl from the mayor. You'll also find the ex-headmaster of Galbadia, Martine, chilling by the mayor's house. He's got a few decent cards on him. Pad out your refining needs if you're running low. At this point in the game, you should be beefing up your characters to tier 2 slots with the best in class magics like regen on HP, protect or life on vitality, demi on magic, reflect or shell on spirit, haste on speed, that kind of thing. Also, don't forget how useful some of those magics are when junctioned to elemental and status defenses too. You can also pick up Occult Band 3 from the old fisherman dude we nearly sent for a dip. This will allow us to summon a new GF, Doom Train. Technically, if you're a fan of grinding, you can complete this before gaining Ragnarok, but it's such a rigmarole that you're just better off waiting. The next significant scene is Irvine putting the band back together for Squall and Renoa's date. I always chose the slow version of the song rather than the fast, as it makes more narrative sense. Or you can mix and match to create a hellish musical soup. If you're on three times speed during this part, you've got the person on piano looking like Mozart, and the one on guitar acting like Herman Lee 
on through the fire and the flames. Once that's all finished, we now have access to Garden as a means of traveling the overworld. Not all locations are accessible, but there are a few important areas and things to tick off. Firstly, we can acquire two new GFs, Tombury and Odin. Let's start with the latter because I specifically did not get Odin on this run. Odin does not have any associated abilities. It will randomly roll into battle and perform Zantetsuken, instantly killing enemies. Later on, it will transform into Gilgamesh after tangling with Sifa. Because of the random nature of its attack, it can sometimes roll into battle at inopportune times, so it's honestly not worth it. Tomberry, however, is worth the effort, but it is definitely a slog. Both these GFs are found in the central ruins. This is located just above the southernmost island, standing ominously in the desert. To bring Tombury on board, you must first defeat 20 normal Tombury in order for Tombury King to announce itself. The frustrating thing is that Tombury's have a lot of health, around 60k, and can use some powerful moves to heavily damage or outright one-shot your team. There's no two ways about it, you'll just have to persevere. The easiest place to do this is around the fountain area of the central ruins. You'll want to keep count of the Tombury's you've defeated. It's when you've defeated the 20th that, in the same battle, the King Tombury appears. This is probably the second most difficult encounter with a GF. You need to be mindful of giving yourself enough time during this fight because if the timer runs out, you're booted out of the ruin. Due to being able to acquire Tombury at different points in the game, its HP can inflate dramatically, all the way to 250k. For our team in that 20 to 30 level zone, we can expect Tombury to have around 50 to 75k HP. That's still quite a tall order. For this battle, I had Squall, Renoa, and Irvine. This was for some specific reasons. Number one is that Tombury has the move It's Sharp, which uses the equation of the target's enemy kills to calculate damage. Basically, the fewer enemies you've killed, the less damage you'll receive. Squalls are murder machine, while Renoa and Irvine, not so much. Junk is another of Tombury King's moves that will cause a random amount of damage, which does have the ability to KO some characters if you're unlucky. Squall's making use of Dark Side for this fight because it has the highest damage potential. He takes back damage every time it's used, with it maxing out at 999. Renoa can focus on summons, while Irvine is there to support through the use of Double and Haste. I screwed up the first time because I didn't outfit Irvine with the item ability, so when Squall's KO'd, which will happen from its sharp, you've got no way to revive him. If you use Zell, he could use life, but currently only three characters, including Squall, can resurrect a character. Back at it again, we're in a better position to have Irvine use the Phoenix Down on Squall if he's down for the count. Due to Phoenix Down's resurrecting a character at low health, you can chance a Rensokoken with Squall to inflict some hefty damage. There's obviously risk with this strategy, and Squall's getting awfully familiar with the ground, but you can grind out victory. While Tombury doesn't innately learn any junctioning abilities, it makes up for it with abilities such as Evasion plus 30 and Luck plus 50%. It can also learn Haggle and Sell High, which are good for your buying and selling power, as well as Call Shop, which can visit any shop you've patronized. Last but not least, it's our first actual proper GF for Irvine. With all the GFs we can obtain at this point in the game bar Doom Train, you can earn some fast AP by hugging the area near Cactuar Island on the world map. You're forced to dock at the beach for now, but if you head through the canyon, it's easy enough to locate. Cactuar give 20 AP a pop, and you can encounter any number from 1 to 4. They also give next to no XP, which means you're in no danger of grinding levels. It is worth spending some time gathering AP for all the abilities you can before proceeding with the next portion of the game. Though the Cactuars are difficult to hit and often flee, Squall at least always hits one of them. Finally, with access to the world map traversal, you can also stock up on a number of useful tier 2 magics you may be missing, or hunt useful items from either mugging or defeating enemies. If you fancy investing the time, you can tailor each magical loadout permanently for each character to reduce the amount of faffing about you may need to do every time you switch your party around. Despite the majority of the world now being your oyster, the next destination you must visit to form the plot is Balam. Currently occupied by Galbadia forces, Squall needs to locate the commander, which consists of an annoying puzzle in order to get Raijin to show himself after unleashing biological warfare on his comrades through badly cooked fish. You'll first battle Raijin accompanied by two normal soldiers. Though he can dole out a powerful hit or two, he is susceptible to status ailments like blind and sleep. You can also steal some strength ups from him as well. However, tangling with Raijin is just a prelude to the actual confrontation with both Bujin and Raijin. While Raijin was in the physical attacking camp, Bujin's more magically inclined. Both, however, are still weak to blind and sleep, making this a trivial encounter of focusing down one foe at a time. 
it is imperative that you draw Pandemona from Fujin, not only to stop her aero and tornado attacks, but because we want to outfit our cowboy with another GF. Pandemona comes equipped with the extremely powerful speed junction ability. Haste is the clear winner in terms of tier 2 magic junction and honestly makes more sense than triple. Pairing this with speed boosting abilities and auto haste makes Irvine an absolute speed demon, getting more turns in than a malfunctioning ferris wheel. Not only that, Pandemona has strength abilities and, if you're feeling spicy, the absorb ability to boot. Speed junctions and their scrolls are perhaps one of the rarest to acquire in the game. Natively, Pandemona, Kerberos and Eden have these abilities. However, with our setup, if you're using Renoa or Irvine in the party, that's not enough to go around. You can mug a speed scroll from Kerberos and get another from having pushed one of the boulders in Lunatic Pandora with Laguna. You can also refine one from two speed ups with Eden's ability, but that is very late game. Our next objective is to follow up on Travi Garden, which didn't fare as well as Blam. Guess they couldn't get the thing moving. Located in the snowy northern continent, the, the forests around here are good for farming, refining materials and drawing magic from the various enemies. Once you've entered Travia, the team convenes in what remains of the basketball court and finally puts together that they were all part of the same orphanage, headed up by Idea or Matron, as they call her. Our next destination will be to seek out that orphanage. Before we go, you can win the selfie card from a girl that selfie was talking to by the fountain when you first entered. Another amusing, if slightly macabre, addition is that if you visit the graveyard, there is a hidden zombie draw point. When you make it over to the old orphanage, you can spy Galvedia Garden not so subtly hovering by a forest. Engaging with the garden sets us on track to finish out disc 2 with a boss battle at the end. When you're ready to kick off the assault, Squall can instruct what he wants Garden to do, so obviously we want to secure the hot dogs above all else. In the OG Japanese, it's not hot dogs that Zell's obsessed with, but yakisoba pan which is basically a hot dog bun filled with noodles. Tasty. You're forced to split your team in two, but I would just turn off encounters for this part because it's so short and inconsequential. Zell and Renoa head to the quad, with Zell asking for Squall's ring for a surprise. Garbedia Garden collides with Balam, taking off a chunk of the quad and forcing Renoa to stumble off the edge. Thanks to a rocky outcropping, she manages to hold on, but time is running out. There's a bunch of running around and talking until Squall finally is ready to rescue Renoa. This consists of a mini game where you're battling a Galbadian soldier or who gets to hold the pole like two strippers fighting at the club. Once Squall's asserted his dominance, you rescue Renoa and land by an entrance to Galbadia. There's a hidden draw point for Aura at the top of the screen and you also have the chance to name Squall's pendant. Why would you change it though? Griever is badass. The gimmick of this garden is that you need to locate a series of three key cards in order to get access to where Idea and Sifa are located. The enemies in this garden do provide some decent spells to draw. Depending on your level, you may even be able to draw spells like Flare and Pain from Triface. However, if you've missed padding out other magic and support skills, there's quite a wealth that you can acquire here. Another important task while we're here is to acquire the Kerberos Summon. This will be Irvine's third summon. There's just Doom Train left. You can save beforehand and I'd recommend doing so because you want to mug the speed junction scroll from Kerberos. I'm not sure and can't be bothered looking up exactly what dictates or influences a successful mug rate. It's higher than in most Final Fantasy games, but I found this one particularly troublesome. It is, however, worth acquiring. Kerberos will cast triple on itself and then start using magic. It's immune to wind magic and will absorb lightning, so you want to stay away from associated summons and magic. If you've been junctioning reflect or spirit to your elemental defenses, you can really shave off a ton of damage from elemental attacks in the game. If you really feel the pinch, then Irvine can cast a spell on Kerberos or you can go with Carbuncle. Beyond that, it's also an important opportunity to draw triple. This is one of the rarest and most powerful magics to draw in the game. Beyond Kerberos, I think there's Odin that you can draw it from. Eventually, you can junction this powerful magic to Squall's attack. Your only other option is to refine Samantha's souls, three of which you gain from the Keystis card. Once Kerberos is on our side, we can close out disc two. This consists of two staggered battles, one with Sifa and then Idea. 
you could save both times before these fights. I chose Selfie and Keystis as backup for these encounters. Sifa, as always, is a joke. You can shore up your defenses for his fire magic and shrug off his physical attack. You should mug him because you get 8 mega phoenixes and those things can be quite hard to come by. The fight with Adea can be somewhat tricky. Firstly, you have to give Sifa another beatdown, which is nothing special. He has a hero or the rarer Holy War, which he can steal. With his defeat, you get access to Idea. First and foremost, you can draw Selfie's next GF, Alexander. Alongside that, you can mug a Royal Crown, which is magic plus 60%. Because all her attacks are magic based, you can quite comfortably junction a bunch of spells to elemental defense. However, I did screw up the first time because, of course, Squall was the only one capable of using an item, so when he ate dirt, I was done. Next time, things go a little better. Keystis is useful because of her ability to use any summon and items. Carbuncle's Ruby Light is capable of buying time because Idea will focus on using Dispel. You need to be mindful of Idea's Maelstrom attack too. One that's as bad as Heartless Angel that leaves you on 1 HP, it does reduce the party's HP by 75%. Idea can also silence your party. This problem can be junctioned away though. On the attacking front, many may be aware she's vulnerable to sleep, only then to be barraged with summons. She does have high spirit, being a sorceress and all, so you're best wailing away with physical attacks to finish her off. When Idea or Adele or Ultimessia or whoever's defeated, Idea will be free from their control, but not before its consciousness is passed into Renoa. Renoa whispers something to Sifa, who gets up and strolls off before Renoa slips into unconsciousness. This marks the end of Disc 2. You may consider this the end of Act 2, but I wouldn't. Traditionally, this is the penultimate peak in action before the one which leads us up into the true Act 3 of the game. Not only that, but if you look at it in terms of what we have to face before reaching Act 3, there's very few actual bosses standing before us. It's more narrative progression than anything else. At the beginning of Disc 3, we are back in Garden. Squall watches over a comatose Renoa. With few leads and a desire to bring Renoa back, Squall visits the orphanage to speak with Matron, Sid. Idea will explain the roots of the sorceress Ultimessia, and you can challenge her to a game of Triple Triad to win the Idea card. Now, Squall intends to locate the white seed ship carrying alone, so that he can have her delve into Renoa's past in order to save her. Locating the white seed ship always felt like a pain in the past, but it's more a case of angling the camera correctly while you're navigating all those little peninsulas. When you've found the ship, Squall hands over the letter of introduction. The seeds reveal that Alone has gone to Estar, while here, you can swap the girl next door with Zone in order to receive the Shiva card. Squall returns to Renoa, and it's not long before we have another dream sequence with the Guna. If you have read one of the Timber Maniacs magazines, Ward will not appear in this section, which I never knew until reading the guide on Jeg. I just never bothered reading the magazines, which are, of course, Laguna's articles. You do, for some reason, get to specifically choose the junction swaps this time around, I assume, because of an impending fight with a ruby dragon. Another cool thing here, which again I never noticed until fairly recently, was that Laguna's performance is who Sifa modeled his entire knightly aesthetic on. The way he holds his sword, attacks, his victory pose, Sifa mimics them all. If you want, you can sleep the dragon and draw flare or meteor, but it's really not worth it right now. Post dream sequence, Squall is determined to haul Renoa all the way to Estar himself. With the bridge broken, you have to go through the salt flats. I know it's more poetic and romantic to carry Renoa on his back, but I would have popped her in a wheelbarrow or used one of those wheelchairs that Garden has, you know, to really speed things up. He's not going at it alone, however, the rest of the gang, including Idea, catch up and will be traveling with him. I never bothered using Idea. There's really no point. She's good, but I wouldn't even recommend fighting anything during this section because aside from making up on any magic she's missing, it offers very little, even more so with the boss of Baden. Like Jero Jero on the train, you can simply use a phoenix down or elixir to help get rid of it. It always reminded me of one of the demons from Nightmare Creatures. What struck me with FF8 is that you don't really have traditional dungeons. This area is cool looking, but it's very short. FF8 goes for breadth more than depth in how you experience world progression. After its defeat, the team finds a gap in an invisible wall, mightily convenient, 
through this, they can enter Estar, but not before they're stricken by another dream sequence. This is the final time we'll be swapping consciousness. It's here we see how Laguna, Kiros, and Ward overthrew Adele as previous ruler of Estar and implanted themselves as its rulers. We also meet Dr. Odin, who was ultimately responsible for creating the machine that allowed Ultimessia to cross time and space. And of course, Laguna finally rescues alone at the expense of never meeting his child and the death of Rain. Laguna lost out on marrying Julia, had his wife die, never met his kid. This guy's been through a lot and still manages to be an upbeat goofball, so props to him. After the sequence, we're in Estar and Squall's dropped off Renoa with Dr. Odin. From the good doctor, you can win the ward card before having some free roam time. During this section, you can obtain a cult fan 4, which isn't useful for this run and make headway into obtaining Combat King 5, which can simply be purchased. What is worth doing is visiting the mall section and cycling through the shops in order for Tombury to call them at your later convenience. On top of that, repeatedly trying to access Cheryl's shop to nab the Rosetta Stone, which allows a GF to learn ability times 4, is totally worth it. Once we're done marveling at Estar, we need to visit the Lunar Gate. Before that though, you can dip into Tears Point and pick up the Solomon Ring, which we'll use to summon Doom Train shortly. The next plot point involves Squall and another party member blasting off into space with Renoa, while Zell and the rest stay behind with Adea. Lunatic Pandora, one of the best names for anything ever, is moving across the city for unknown reasons. Putting our faith in Zell, we'll be stuck with him for a while now. We head back to Estar and to Odin's lab. He'll give us some info on Lunatic Pandora, which has now been taken over by the Galbadian military and therefore Sifa. During its path across the city, you have three opportunities to board the craft. Back when I was a kid, finding Estar a maze, I always failed this. All I had to go on at the time was some pixelated black and white images in an unofficial guidebook. Good luck to anyone who was trying to do this without it. You have a generous amount of time, 15 minutes in all, to board Lunatic Pandora. If not, it doesn't really matter. If you do manage to board the craft and had previously done a bunch of seemingly inconsequential actions with Laguna during his visit, you will have unlocked a few things, namely an ultimate draw point, Phoenix Pinion, which acts like a Phoenix Summit, a Power Generator, Love Love G, Combat King 5 from a dude along the way, and the Speed Junction Scroll. Ultimately, however, you are booted off Lunatic Pandora by a mechanical sentry. We then cut the Squall at the Lunar Base. This is mostly for a story focused section, but you can earn two triple triad cards, which are perhaps the most difficult. The Lunar Base basically has all the rules there can be in triple triad. The most frustrating of all being the random rule. If you have been religiously refining cards, the effects of random can be somewhat mitigated. However, other rules like plus, minus, and same can catch you out. It is entirely possible to win both the Alexander card from Piet and the Laguna card from Alone, just make sure you save beforehand. Though you may want to skip it entirely, I am specifically not fighting Omega Weapon in this run. This is not out of difficulty. Normally, you just grab the Laguna card, refine it into 100 heroes, then use the hero during battle with Omega and spam Lionheart. I cannot be bothered with that. Plus, it would mess up the levels. It's totally possible, however. After catching up with Alone, while she can't change the past, she can learn from it in the hopes of understanding the present and potentially affecting the future. This doesn't quite ameliorate our current circumstances, but that is swiftly interrupted by Renoa going all cloud in FF7's Temple of the Ancients Crater. We can't stop the possessed Renoa, only watch her deactivate Adele's tomb, allowing the body to be swept up in the Lunar Cry, an event which sends a waterfall of monsters to the planet's surface. Everyone's forced to evacuate, which forces Squall to abandon Renoa who had exited the base in order to release another one of Adele's seals. As you might expect, after going through all this effort, Squall's not about to let Renoa die in the cold vastness of space. You'll engage in a minigame to save her, then, rather fortunately, come across the Ragnarok, an old spaceship thought lost. You board the ship, deal with the alien propagators in order to take control, and then we're treated to one of FF8's most famous scenes. Upon landing, we have Estar troops waiting for us. Because the sorceress's will is inside Renoa, she is to face the same fate as Adele, being locked up. Renoa willingly surrenders and they take her to the Sorceress's Memorial just as the rest of your team arrive. To this day, I do not know why the game gives you control of the Ragnarok here. Squall has just risked his life, his feelings are known to Renoa, and he just lets her go again. Instead of the game and Squall going, nah, I'm not letting her go after all this. You're free to spend 
hours doing anything but rescue Renoa. It's ridiculous. So of course, that's the first thing we do. Now, with Renoa back in the party, Act 3 has truly begun. The final act of the game largely consists of the assault on Lunatic Pandora and then Ultimessi's castle in the future. There's a bunch but not a ton of prep beforehand. First, in some narrative house cleaning, we head to Estar and finally meet President Laguna, who's still a bit coy about speaking to Squall about his heritage, though it's pretty clear. Laguna, Kiros, and Ward then join us on Ragnarok. You can play Laguna in Triple Triad to grab Squall's card, arguably the best in the game. Let's get ourselves one of the few remaining GFs. For Doom Train, we require four separate batches of items. First is the Solomon Ring, which we picked up from Tears Point. Second are six Marlboro Tentacles. These are best stolen from Marlboros that you can encounter in Grandidi Forest. An infamous enemy, I hope you have a bunch of magic junctioned to status defense. A sooner paired with anything to stop confusion and berserk is probably the most helpful. You should avoid defeating Marlboros, which with death junctioned is fairly easy. You just need to steal the tentacles and dip. Thirdly, we need six remedy pluses. You obtain these by purchasing 60 remedies. Then you use Alexander's med level up ability to refine them. Finally, there are six steel pipes. These can be mugged from the Wendigo enemies in the forest that you had the dream sequence in with Laguna. With all these items obtained, you just use the Solomon Ring and Doom Train is yours. I believe a lot of people slept on this, but it's honestly an awesome addition to Irvine's arsenal. Damage notwithstanding, along with potentially inflicting nearly every status ailment there is, similar to Hades, Doom Train also inflicts Meltdown. Meltdown reduces an enemy's vitality to zero, ensuring you can inflict the maximum amount of physical damage. Awesome. Along with that, it's also got a bunch of status junctions, as well as the Junk Shop ability, so you can more easily access the weapon upgrade store. Speaking of weapon upgrades, let's get ourselves one for Squall. As I mentioned way back when, he's the only character I bothered with because we won the Lionheart Limit Break. Obviously, you need the first edition of Weapons Monthly, found during Laguna's last dream sequence. However, if you missed that, as long as you have the materials required themselves, the weapon will just unlock in the shop. Three ingredients in varying quantities are required to craft Lionheart. Adamantine, which can be dropped from Adamantoises in the beaches around Dole. Four dragon fangs, you get these from drops from blue dragons. Though they are in the Beaker Snowfield Forest near Trabia, you may have better luck on the islands closest to heaven and hell due to the higher level nature of the enemies there. The final item is Pulse Ammo, 12 rounds. Using Ifrit's Ammo Refine ability, you can refine an Energy Crystal, which drops from Elm Oil, in order to refine 10 pieces. So you may need two Energy Crystals in total. With that, we now have Lionheart. Next up is another GF, Cactuar. This is Zell's final GF. Cactuar is found, funnily enough, on Cactuar Island which is a lone island on the southeastern portion of the world. It pops out of the ground every few seconds, so you just have to collide with it to initiate battle. Cactua has a ton of HP, but is vulnerable to water magic, just like the normal Cactua. As well as general attacks, it can use 10,000 needles, which is an insta-kill. It also has Kaplunk, which will inflict party-wide damage. Meltdown can be extremely useful in this battle, but only Irvine can wield it by the move itself or through Doom Train. We'll cover high level magic shortly because it's honestly not needed. A pairing of Zell and Selfie works well for this fight. Zell has Leviathan, which will put into work as well as recover and life or healing duties. Selfie meanwhile has Revive, which will fully restore a knocked out character. However, any combination works. Renoa's water attacks can be extremely effective. Squall using Dark Side with Water Junction will easily reach the damage cap. Irvine working on hasting and doom training and tripling people works wonders too. Once obtained, we can put Cactua on Zell. While its summon attack obviously improves as you level it up further, it's not quite as useful in this sort of run. What is extremely useful is the luck and evasion junctions Cactua has, along with boosts to those stats. We have a couple of the hardest battles in the game coming up very soon, so now is the best time to outfit ourselves with the best possible magic. The way tier 3 magic works in this system is that once a character has a tier 3 magic, let's say triple, junction to one of their stats, no one else can then junction that magic to a stat. So if Squall's got it on attack, no one else can junction that level 3 magic to a slot 
in their stats, let's say Renault's Magic. However, Tier 3 Magic can be freely junctioned to either Elemental or Status Defense attack to make up for the lower defensive stat. Let's take a look at the best Magic and how we obtain it. Triple was obtained from either Kerberos or Refining Samantha Souls from the Keystis card. The latter is the easiest way. Full Life is a best life magic refined from Regem Rings, which can be mugged from Tarama enemies that are most easily encountered at Tears Point after the Lunar Fall event. Meteor is most easily drawn from high level Ruby Dragons from the islands closest to Heaven and Hell. Be warned, its breath attack is vitality based and can very easily wipe your party. Go in there with someone like Squall and Selfie, who have the highest HP potential and have the third member cast sleep on the dragon. For Flare, you're doing the same thing as above with the Ruby Dragon. Ultima has a few ways that you can obtain it. There were a couple of draw points we've already encountered, giving you perhaps around 20. You can pay for the draw point in the Shumi Village, or you can draw it from Ultima Weapon, which we've not tangled with yet. You also get 100 Ultima Stones, for defeating Ultima. Don't worry too much about this magic, you honestly don't need it to junction with because there are other better alternatives, just keep it to Renoa. There are other ways to obtain this magic but they are extremely convoluted and would inflate our levels, it's just not needed. Meltdown, you can use support magic refine to refine mystery fluid into meltdown magic which you can mug or be rewarded with for defeating the galas in the snowy areas around Travia Garden. Karaga's easy, refine it from tents, cottages, wizard stones. Tornado can be refined from windmills, which you can obtain from the Thrustavis around Galbadia. Holy can be drawn from high level Elnoils. You can use the fixed encounter from the creepy dude in Estar and then Tombury's level up ability if needed. Finally, Aura can be refined from Fury Fragments into 5 Aura Magic. Steal those from a blue dragon using Mug or from red dragons upon their defeat. Like Ultima, you can make up for their power through the stat allocations and boosts, so it's not really needed. Depending on how much you care about swapping magic between switching characters, feel free to get as many as 100 sets of these magic as needed. With all that complete, let's acquire the remaining GF. Both are located at the Deep Sea Research Center. The first is Squall's final GF for Hamo. You find the center close to the most southwesterly portion of the world map. Upon landing, you enter an area with a large tank that emits an eerie blue light. When the light flares bright and you move, you'll be forced into an encounter. These cannot be avoided, but they can be run from. Be careful you don't get stricken with silence or zombie before fleeing. Your ultimate goal is to reach the tank. When you do, you are asked a series of questions. Answer correctly, you'll be thrown into a fight against a red dragon. Answer incorrectly, you'll be kicked out and have to start this entire process again. The red dragons are extremely dangerous. You fight two in total. You may want magic that mitigates fire and wind damage, such as Viraga and Tornado, and to lesser extents, magic like Full Life, Protect, Shell, yada yada. Also, you may want to junction lightning magic for the upcoming boss. The dragons are weak to blizzard magic, so you may want that junction to attack or just be ready to wail on the enemy with Arga spells. As I mentioned before, red dragon's breath attack can be the most dangerous with it easily going 6.5k damage per team member if you've not invested anything into vitality. However, it's not so much the first red dragon that tends to be the problem. I believe this one is always at a slightly lower level. It's the next red dragon. You begin in a back attack, which I don't think a lurk can fix, and the dragon tends to use breath right away on the majority of occasions. There's no great way around this, so you need to tank the damage in either your vitality or your health, or possibly get the initiative and cast sleep. Because of this, it can often be a larger challenge than the upcoming boss itself. However, sometimes if you're lucky and you did get Odin, it will come in the battle and Zantetsukin the opponent. But if you defeat the second Ruby Dragon, your HP doesn't get refilled between the fights, by the way. You are ready then to answer the final question. It is, of course, the hidden third option. Selecting this will initiate a battle with our penultimate GF, Bahamut. Bahamut's magical attack comes in two flavors, thunder and wind. If you've got your elemental defenses or spirits set up, this isn't going to be a problem. Depending on your character's stats, its physical attacks can do anywhere from 1.5 to 3.5k damage. This can be mitigated by inflicting blind, or you can have someone with a high evasion rating. Depending on how long this battle takes, Bahama has the potential to unleash its signature move, Mega Flare. This ignores any defensive stats for your characters and will inflict around 4.5k damage. This, in my first setup, tackling Bahama was a party wipe, so GG. 
The problem of heading into this fight with Renoa or Kistis meant that by their nature, the characters had less than 4.5k HP. This is not to say the battle is impossible with these characters, you could simply inflict enough damage that Bahamut never gets a chance to use Mega Flare, which is certainly possible. The problem, like most things in life, was myself. It's been a while since I'd bought Bahamut and just forgot the strat. Even though my party was outputting more than adequate damage, Mega Flare came along and just tore through everyone. So I decided to rethink things. Second time through, we swapped Keystis for Selfie for that HP buffer. And this is not saying that you have to insert a character with high HP. This is absolutely achievable with characters that are lower level and only have zombie junction to HP. Selfie, as always, is useful because of moves like Defend, Protect, and especially Revive. A slots limit also help out in a pinch. Of course, we want to blind Bahamut as soon as the battle begins because one hit from it is capable of taking out Renoa. While it's a shame in this particular battle we can't take advantage of Kerberos or triple for Renoa, she can still output decent damage and even Selfie can put in a shift with Holy. The combination works well because we've covered a lot of bases for the fight and with Squall being the main damage dealer with Darkseid, it's not too long before things go our way. As for our new GF, it can natively be assigned to either Squall or Renoa. It does have some awesome abilities like Strength and Magic plus 60, Auto Protect, a bit of Magic Refine, and expend 2 to 1, not to mention its ability times 4. One thing I haven't mentioned here but is in the rules is exactly what kind and how many character abilities you can equip. Basically, you can only have one type active at a time, but what do I mean by that? If you've got strength plus 60, you can't augment that further by strength plus 40, 20, things like that. Honestly, there is just no need. Ultimate Weapon in Eden are the final tasks for us to complete, not only in the Deep Sea Research Center, but in the game before we infiltrate Lunatic Pandora. Now, for the love of all that is holy, do not do what I did here. I made this entire ordeal a massive pain in the ass out of stupidity and forgetfulness. Essentially, once you defeat Bahamut, you then need to exit the center and return to Ragnarok. In order for the next part of the center to open up for some reason, you must physically press the button to enter Ragnarok, not just leave the ship and then return to the center. This opens up a path to the excavation center below. Your task here is a sort of puzzle to use the pressure in order to open a series of hatches that delve further into the center until you reach the excavation site. If you bring Zell with you, he'll offer to open up the final door to the excavation site through percussive maintenance. You do not want this. Why? Because doing this triggers a series of around three battles per floor against high level enemies. Enemies such as red dragons and iron giants. This makes the area a slog and dangerous to boot. Utilizing Zell often plays into farming curse spikes, which can be refined into a series of useful items, but we do not need them for this type of run. FFA is not a particularly hard game, so you don't need them for any kind of run, quite frankly. Without Zell, it requires you to be a little smarter with this whole section, but there are plenty of guides out there to help with that. So don't use him, stick on Encounter Non, and just head to the bottom where you require 10 RSP to retract the crane. Use Siren's ability or just keep mashing accept until you find the hidden save point and save before the battle. Do not do what I did. I forgot that using Zell forces these encounters and I forgot there was a save point down here. So what happened? I kept losing to Ultima and then had to make the slog each time. Once you activate the winch, a small scene plays before you're thrust into the battle with Ultima Weapon. I am not using Aura or Heroes for this battle. Ultima has a number of attacks. Its most devastating is Light Pillar, which does 9,999 damage, basically a one-shot. I'm not sure if this move works independently of its turn counter because it likes to use Light Pillar, then immediately attack, or even use a second Light Pillar. Very frustrating. Its physical slash will cause about 1.5k damage to your party. Quake can easily be countered by junctioning, and it's useful to make sure you absorb the element for some easy healing. In terms of a team to face Ultima, the biggest thing in this battle is speed. The second is keeping characters on standby. Ultima is quick and what often happens is it will just outpace your team if you've not hasted or have magic junction to speed. Keeping two characters on standby is for healing purposes. It's overly cautious but as soon as someone is KO'd by Light Pillar you want them back up and in the fight. If someone's in low health you want them to be able to tank another physical attack. A lot of guides out there may tell you to just use Aura and Hero in this battle, but of course, we're not doing that. Ultima also has Gravager, which will reduce everyone's HP by 75%. This is why I converted our newly acquired Bahamut card into 100 Megalixes. 
This will be our main form of party-wide healing from here on out. You can also draw Eden from Ultima, which is the first thing you want to do with Squall. Drawing Ultima is not worth it. You will get 100 Ultima Stones from defeating this boss, so don't have someone with Mug. The team I landed on for the fight was Squall, Irvine and Selfie. Selfie once again because she has revive, Irvine because he is a beast. The only thing that can defeat Irvine in this battle is Light Pillar. Quake heals him and his evasion is so high that nothing hits him. He's there to haste other people, use Doom Train and Kerberos. Selfie's exclusively on healing duty, whether through Triple Karaga or Revive. Squall has Drain Junction to attack in case he wants to heal, but will mostly be relying on Dark Side. As mentioned, maintaining that rhythm is key. After Irvine's got Kerberos and Doom Train off, him and Selfie are on standby. Because Turn Order is just a suggestion to Ultima, it can quickly create a position where it'll light pillar two characters and then immediately physical attack another and it's GG. Ideally, we want to get ourselves in a position where Squall's been using Dark Side and tanking the odd physical attack so that he's in Renzokokan range. If we can maintain this balance, we can ensure we have decent attacking options while having those other two waiting in the wings to provide support. Once Ultima is down, we play Eden and can close out the game. If you really wanted to min-max FF8, then Eden and its Devourer ability is how you do it. Kind of pointless and not something we'll be using. However, Eden does possess valuable speed and evasion junction, which make it great for Renoa. Along with this, it has Luck plus 50% and Expend 3 to 1, which make Ultima and Flare go a long way. Of course, you could just always summon the thing for a ridiculously long scene and some awesome damage. With all the prep done, we can take Ragnarok and smash into the side of Lunatic Pandora. Honestly, not much can stand in our way now. Closing out the game from here is basically one big boss rush. A boss rush that begins with Fujin and Raijin. My team for a large portion of this section will be Keystis and Zell for no apparent reason. Like before, Fujin and Raijin can be statist, which trivializes matters. Though they do have higher level magic and can technically hit harder, you should be so sourced up right now that they're simply no match. Level wise, I'm hoping we're in that or at least getting close to that level 65 threshold. The next fight is with Mobile Type 8. If you boarded Lunatic Pandora with Zell previously, then this big robot booted you out. The most dangerous move the boss has is Corona, which will reduce all party members HP to 1. Lightning is its weakness, so relying on a GF or Aga magic can really rack up damage, especially once it's section split. Like a number of battles at this point in the game, reducing an enemy's vitality to Meltdown or Doom Train can be extremely helpful, though not explicitly required. Once it's defeated, you can proceed forward with the two final encounters in Lunatic Pandora. Heading into the room with Sifa and Adele marks the point of no return and the final portion before Disc 4. Sifa, like most of his appearances throughout the game, is still a joke. He does have aura magic that you can draw from him, which is one of the best junctions in the game. If you had recruited Odin in your team, this is where it would appear and attempt to strike down Sifa. However, comically, Sifa defeats it and births Gilgamesh instead. You can happily draw aura at your leisure and then focus on wailing on Sifa to close out the fight. Our final battle is against Sorceress Adele. Whether Renoa was with you or not, she'll appear here because the plot demands that she be possessed once again. If she were in your team, you'll have to replace her. The fight with Adele is more gimmick than anything. Adele will draw HP from Renoa to use her high level magics. You don't want to use attacks that target multiple enemies because you'll toast Renoa in the process. Your focus should be on keeping Renoa's health topped up via healing magics, drawing regen from Renoa and then casting it is also a viable strategy. Aside from that, it's Squall and Darkseid all the way. Adele, rather disappointingly, is not a great nor climactic battle. There aren't many in F8 that are, to be honest, which is kind of a shame. But when you land the killing blow on Adele, Renoa is freed, but then time compression goes haywire and we're flung into a desolate future. The next section is rather easy. It's just a battle against a number of sorceresses as you travel through all the significant locations that you visit in the game. If you have pain junction to a character's stats attack, you can blind, silence and poison the witches, making this whole ordeal extra trivial. Though there is a slightly tougher sorceress waiting for you at this section's climax, it's nothing that your team should be incapable of handling at this point in the game. The thing will counter-attack and I'm convinced the animation used here is the same as one of those experiments 
in the sunken Gelnica in FF7. Squall and the others then find themselves back at the orphanage, which just so happens to be a Dexus leading to Ultimessia's castle. You find the area littered with the corpses of white seeds. Great chains anchor the gothic castle to this world. As you dash up the chains, you'll notice several portals lined up. There is, if you like, a way back to the world as it exists now, similar to the world of Ruin in FF6. While all the side quests have been cut off, you can go and get Ragnarok back through some convoluted methods. All your prep should have been completed before tackling this section, however. Everyone reunites at the castle's entrance. Beyond here is the final boss rush of the game, if you want it to be. While there are a number of powerful bosses, I use that term lightly. The biggest issue I have with all the bosses here is that by design, they can only be so powerful because you may battle them in different orders and the abilities you have equipped may vary. The reason abilities may vary is that upon entering Ultimessia's castle, a strange pall falls upon the cast. This locks all your abilities except attack. When you defeat one of the bosses, you can unlock an ability. It can be things like GF, magic, saving, the ability to revive party members, etc. Your junctions still work, it doesn't lock those however. That being the case, there's not a great deal to talk about with these bosses. They do offer an interesting element in that you can tailor the difficulty of your final encounter. I reckon that I'd end up drawing out the final battle more than anything. The Sphinx at the top of the stairs is basically mandatory and all you can do is wail on it. What sucks most about the bosses is that if you've been playing Triple Triad and seen their cards, or just look at them, they appear extremely formidable. Truth is, they're not. Like Ultimessia, they have a level cap. 55 is the max, so if you're overleveled too much, then it'll be even easier than they are already. After Sphinx, you have a bit of free reign on who you take out next. There are a few sticking points, namely with bosses like Trauma, Red Giant or Krista, which benefit from moves like Meltdown or Doom Train in a pinch. I feel like there should have been a set order to the bosses so that they could be tailored to you having unlocked abilities and really test your knowledge of the junctioning system, but the game's already established it doesn't quite trust the player enough to test them on it. If you fancied a real test, then you could always challenge Omega Weapon. While it used to be fixed to 100 in the OG version, in the PC and remastered version, it's at different levels. While moves like level 5 death can be easily avoided, it's stuff like Megiddo Flame, which deals 9,998 damage to everyone, or Ultimate or Terror Break, that means the battle necessitates using heroes or holy walls. Then, as I said, you just wail on the thing after casting Aura. While much more feasible with a job system than Ruby or Emerald from FF7, I just don't think the juice is worth the squeeze here. With all our abilities unlocked, we can close out the run with our final series of battles. Four, to be specific, Ultimessia, Griever, Ultimessia who's Junction Griever, then Ultimessia for realsies. So who's gonna be our party? That's for Ultimessia to decide. In FF7 and FF6, you basically could craft your A team and B team and whatnot. Here, it's random. When you start the battle, it can be anyone from your team. If a party member is not out and you do not revive them within a certain time frame, they are absorbed into time, meaning that they will not be available for the rest of the fight. With that in mind, you're best outfitting your best two party members in addition to Squall. Then, when an undesirable party member is KO'd, you simply allow them to be absorbed until your preferred party member arrives. In our case, Squall notwithstanding, our preferred members are Selfie and Irvine. I'll stress that anyone is viable as long as you understand what you're getting yourself into. We have Selfie for Aura and Revive, while Irvine is focused on either casting Meltdown in one form or another, or using an item to heal or revive party members. The first section of the fight is against a more human looking Ultimessia. She doesn't have a great deal of HP. We get a bit of luck on our side because we start with both Squall and Irvine. Kestis is there but really can't do a whole lot. Though rare, it is possible that you don't start with Squall but with an alternate member too. Ultimessia can cast Meltdown on your party but a lot of attacks you receive are magic based. Not to mention you can heal out of the problem with a Remedy or an Elixir. She'll also cast Maelstrom, which reduces everyone's health to 62.5% and potentially inflicts Curse, which will not allow a character to use their Limit Break. Alongside this, Ultimessia has access to a number of powerful spells, but the damage can be mitigated by having decent junctions. To save myself some trouble, I just knock Keystis out in order to speed up getting the party member we want. But it's not long 
before the first phase of the fight is over. The next phase is against Breaver. It's important you don't take any risks with our status or elemental attack junctions because Grieber absorbs or is ineffective to a number of elements and statuses. We're not in a position to use Selfie's aura right now, so we're relying on pure damage output. Grieber has the ability to destroy your entire magic stock, even magic that you have junctioned to a stat. You can attempt to lessen this by chucking a bunch of low level magic on your characters, but luck may not be in your favor. In this battle, rather hilariously, Squall's triple gets blown away later on, which was junctioned to his strength. You want Meltdown cast Reaver as soon as possible to help with the damage output, but because of our chosen strats, Reaver will be able to cast its most powerful move, Shockwave Pulsar. The background stage will begin to pick up speed to convey the move is imminent. This move will outright KO characters who have less than 5k HP, so be ready with what revives, Phoenix Downs or Elixirs you have. Much like Ultima, it's important to keep actions in reserve. What makes this difficult is when you have characters that can do nothing but attack. Reva also likes to cast Pain, which causes Poison, Blind and Silence, so it's simpler to just Mega Elixir your way out of it. Finally, it'll also draw magic from you and then cast it but the effectiveness of this varies. Irvine's the one that ends up dealing the fatal blow to Griever with Tombri. GF's still be ineffective after all this time. In the next phase, Ultimessia will junction herself unto Griever. The approach remains the same here, cast Meltdown as insurance in case anyone's damaging stock is blown away. Typically, this is the part in the battle where you want everyone pumping out damage. We don't have that luxury though. It'll summon Helixes to enhance its strength. When there are two of these things, It'll then cast Great Attractor, which bypasses Spirit and Vitality for massive damage. I was focused on attacking these things for a little while, but I honestly don't think it's worth it. You're going to get hit with Great Attractor, so you're best off just tanking it and being ready to heal. Summoning doesn't work here because Ultimessia will just outright destroy them too. Thankfully, Del finally decides to call it quits and gets himself KO'd, so we should have Selfie coming out next. We get hit with Great Attractor, which Squall tanks surprisingly well, but Irvine doesn't get off so lightly so we're using a Mega Phoenix. Cell's now back in the picture. Great. Soon, however, Selfie's finally with us and we can actually start using Aurora, though we haven't really needed it. After a Renzo Koken, a portion of Griever is destroyed and now you're pitted against the upper heart. This part goes down much easier than the full body, which then leads into the final, final boss, Ultimessia. It's split into two halves, the upper and the lower. By keeping the lower half alive, it's able to draw powerful magic and cast Apocalypse. If you had a cheating device back in the day, you could actually get this magic and junction it because it does have associated stats. At level 65, which I believe it is, it has around 280,000 HP. Its Hell's Judgment ability reduces all party members to 1 HP, so you absolutely want to throw out a Mega Elixir or have someone on a triple Karaga duty. If Apocalypse is successful, it'll cause around 8k damage unless you've got Shell Up. So in our case, we just keep Aura on Squall, healed when Hell's Judgment or any widely damaging move happened, and chanced attacks with other characters if the moment presented itself. Once Ultimessia's HP is effectively gone, she'll start her little monologue. The fight's not over though. She'll keep attacking you, so you must inflict at least 100 damage to progress her dialogue. After the fifth and final attack, she's done. And with that, we're done. It's finished. The run itself is much more, and I don't want to say convoluted, but requires much more management than the job run I did in FF7 in that game. Materia acquisition is pretty static or controllable. In FF8, there's much more required of the player, whether that's figuring out which junctions are most sensible and when the best time to acquire magic is. As such, it lends itself to actually creating jobs and ends up being a lot more enjoyable and nuanced. In the description, you'll find a link to the spreadsheet that covers the rules, tiers, magics, endgame setups, things like that. So give it a go and let me know how you get on. And if you want to like and subscribe, go for it. Until next time, take it easy.